Good morning, family. How are you? You know, we are family, right? Brothers and sisters. Yes, yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, my name is Don Earhart. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm thrilled, thrilled to be up front with you again this morning. It's been a while since I've been up here, and uh, my palms are a little sweaty. You guys scare me. The younger ones, they don't scare me so much, but you guys, you guys scare me. Um, normally, I, I work with, my responsibility is birth to high school graduation, and I love to hang out with our high school students, a bunch are over here, and uh, that's where, where I spend most of my time. I, I love the challenge of helping uh, our, young, our young people move from, from um, being with their parents and their parents teaching them and helping them to know and to follow Jesus to a place where they know and follow Jesus on their own and it's their decision and, and it's our dream that our high school graduates uh, know, follow Jesus, have been invested in by some other adults who, who know and follow Jesus and that we help our students to actually graduate with high school knowing how to invest in others so that they can follow Jesus too. That's our dream and our passion and we spend a lot of time trying to make that happen and it's it's really, really exciting. I'm so thankful for, for this church family and all the adults and our staff who are part of, part of making that happen. So thank you. Well, several weeks ago, I found myself in a precarious situation. It was 3.30 a.m., and I was out in the street uh, in my boxer shorts and my T-shirt barefoot talking to the police. <laughs> so let me give you the backstory. Uh, yeah. I worked really hard on, on developing that moment there. So uh, I couldn't sleep one night, probably because I was worrying about something I shouldn't have been worried about. But uh, I got up and I came downstairs. It was obviously dark outside and it was dark inside. And our front door has one of those little windows and it just happens to be at the right height. So when I stand there, I can look out and I can see. And I looked out this window and I saw this gentleman dressed in all dark clothes with a, a dark hoodie up over his head, and he was just taking a nice walk at 3.30 in the morning in our neighborhood, and I thought, hmm, interesting. Why and who would do that on a very cold night, uh, just walk? So I kept my eyes on him, and, and he was on the, the sidewalk across the street, and he worked his way around our little cul-de-sac, and then he disappeared. And I, I kind of watched and waited, and, and, and then all of a sudden he reappeared, and then he came to our neighbor's house, and that's when things changed. I saw him try to open the door of my neighbor's truck, and then he came, and he walked in our neighborhood, and he tried to open my Jeep door, and that's when something rose up within me in my boxer shorts. <laughs> and I opened that door, and I said, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm so glad that he chose to run. <laughs> so... He takes off running down the street, and I initially started to chase him, and I'm like, well, no, don't. And, uh, and there was about a half block down the, our road, there was a car, and, and uh, it was running, and I hadn't noticed it, and the brake lights came on, this guy jumps in, and they take off. And so, so I ended up, that's why I ended up talking to the police out there. So why, why would I tell that story? Well, when you're outside at night, under the cover of darkness, that often means that you don't want people to see you. There's something going on that, that you're hiding under that causes you to, to go out at night. And, and you can contrast that. Let's say that you're out at night and you're lost. And maybe back in Jesus' day, before they had electricity and there are lions and there are bandits and scary things, if you're out at night then you and you're lost, then you are longing, praying for the sun to come up, for the light to shine, so that the danger will dissipate and so that you can make your way to wherever you need, you need to go. Those two things, light and darkness, contrast. And this morning we're going to talk, we're going to continue to talk about light and darkness, light of the world. And I want to start out this morning by, just by throwing out a serious, a serious question that I, I want each of us to wrestle with. And here, here it is. How is your posture toward God? This morning, how is your posture toward God? Are you facing God or do you have your back to him? Are you, you doing everything you can to kind of ignore what's going on from his perspective? 
with your face pointing away from him and your back facing him? Or do you have a posture that's facing God where you're, you're showing your thankfulness to him, where you're, you're praising him and you're worshiping him and where you're trying to get as close as you possibly can to him, where you're talking to him, where you're interacting with him? Well, that's where we're gonna go this morning. We're gonna navigate and wrestle with with our posture toward God. This morning, we're continuing with our series called Light of the World. This is, this is week two. It's a Christmas series with a twist. The twist is we are actually talking about the Christmas story through the book of John. And if you know much about the Bible, you know that, that there are four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but only two of those gospels, Matthew and Luke, actually address the birth of Jesus. The other two, Mark and John, don't even address the birth of Jesus. And so our twist is we are looking at the life of Jesus during Christmas, the light of the world, through the book of John. If you're here last week, you'll know that, that Adam got us started, and it was a great message. As a matter of fact, I sat right back there, and I thought, oh, man, somebody's got to follow this. Oh, dang. That's me. It was really good, so I encourage you to go back and listen, listen to, uh, go to our website and listen to the message from last week. When the Apostle John wrote this book, he was probably in his 80s and possibly even 90 plus years old. All the other original apostles had been killed. They had been uh, martyred in cruel and atrocious ways and, and, and because of their faith in Jesus, they were no longer around. And now we have John, this old man who had these stories because he saw Jesus, he touched Jesus, he interacted with Jesus, he, he uh, saw Jesus crucified, Jesus told him to take care of his mother. I mean, there was all sorts of things going on, and I can imagine that the Holy Spirit moved on John to, to make sure that he wrote these accounts. And in the book of John, 90% of the material we have is unique material. It's not in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so out of that uniqueness this morning, with that in mind, I, I want to have us turn to John chapter 3 where Jesus reveals, Jesus reveals the light of the world in the context of Jesus speaking to a man named Nicodemus. These are, these are red letters in our Bible. And what that means is these are the actual words of Jesus. Compared to last week where Adam took us, it was John setting up the gospel of what we know the gospel of John. And they weren't red letter words, but this morning these are the actual words of Jesus. And there are two questions that I want us to work through this morning, and here they are. I'm just going to give them to you. The first one is this. Why do we need the light? Why is that important? Why do we even need the light? Why is that a big deal? The second question is, what does it mean to love the darkness more than light? Now, that doesn't make sense, but as we get into the, the text, you'll see that those are the words that Jesus brings up. So we're going we're gonna to dig through that. Let's start in verse 1, and we'll get going here. John 3, 1. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So this morning, I, I will probably reference Nicodemus as Nick, just because it's kind of cute. So if I say that... Nick is Nicodemus, and so Nick comes to Jesus, and he basically says two things right off the bat that are a little fishy. He says, hey, Jesus, we know that God sent you to teach us, and two, the miracles are, are just evidence of that. Now, if you know anything about the Pharisees, you'll know that they really struggled with whether Jesus was the Messiah who was sent from the Father to, to the earth. Matter of fact, part, of the, part of, the, of the setup for Jesus being crucified was they actually didn't believe it, and they wanted to kill this imposter who was claiming to be the Son of God. And so there's something fishy right off the bat with what Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And so Jesus starts this interaction which is awesome and amazing. And we could speak for weeks on, on what Jesus is about to tell us. But for the purpose of this morning, we're going to focus on the idea of Jesus, the light of the world. So let's continue in verse 3. Jesus replied, I, I tell you the truth, Nick. Unless you're born again, 
you can't see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born? It's kind of an edgy response. Jesus replied to Nicodemus, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of the water and spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit, he gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised, Nick, when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, and just as you can hear the wind but can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus says, how are these things possible? Jesus continues, you, Nicodemus, are are a respected Jewish leader, and you don't understand these things? I assure you, we tell you what we have, what we know and have seen, and yet you won't believe our testimony. But Nick, if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how in the world are you going to believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? No one is ever going to heaven and return, Nicodemus, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Whenever I read scripture, I'd love to, uh, to kind of make bullet points out of, out of what I think the, the text is saying. And so I've made some bullet points, and it obviously doesn't cover everything, but just some of the highlights that I think of how Jesus responds to Nicodemus are, are following. Nicodemus, just as you know, there is wind, and though you can't see it, know that the Holy Spirit brings new birth to people, even though you can't see the Holy Spirit. And Nicodemus, I assure you, you can take it to the bank. We tell you what we know and have seen, but yet you don't believe our testimony. I think it's interesting when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, he says, hey, we believe that God sent you. And Jesus, in his response, says, hey, we have a message for you, and you don't believe us. So there's there's a contrast going on there. Jesus is helping us to understand that, that he knew Nicodemus wasn't buying that he was the Messiah. And yet, and yet, Nicodemus came and had this interaction, and I'm so thankful that he did. Continuing the bullet points, if you don't believe me when I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe when I tell you about heavenly things. No one is ever going to heaven in return, Nicodemus, but, but Nicodemus, the son of man, has come down from heaven. Now, if you remember weeks back as we worked through this book of Mark, uh, the son of man was just a reference to the Messiah. And if you're interested, you can look at book of, the book of Daniel and you can find out kind of the background of that, but it's just a reference. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, hey, I am the son of man and I have come from heaven to earth. And he, he then tells a story that Nicodemus would have known well uh, because he was a, an Israelite and a Pharisee. And the story was, as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, Jesus says, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. And Jesus reminds Nicodemus of a time when God sent a, a plague of snakes into the Israelite camp because, they, because God was tired of their whining and, and their complaining. Nicodemus, he knew this story. He knew what that was about. These snakes bit people and caused many of the Israelites to die. And God directed Moses to, to make a serpent out of bronze and to put it on the stick and to lift it up. And as the Israelites looked toward this, this bronze snake on this stick, uh, they would be healed of their snake bites. And Jesus says, he also would be lifted up so that everyone who looks, who believes in him, will have eternal life. And so we get a hint, hint to this first question is, why do we need the light? Nicodemus is told by Jesus, I came from heaven and I have come down to earth that whoever puts their faith in me will have 
eternal life. I mean, these are, these are amazing words. We, we know this story because we've grown up in church and we, I think we lose the power of it. This is an amazing story that Jesus is throwing out to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus can't get his arms around it. You see him, I mean, his, his responses are, are, are kind of crazy. He can't get his arms around it. Jesus is laying it out for Nick that God loves the world. That God makes his love for the world known by sending his one and only, his unique son here to earth so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Talk about the greatest gift ever. This is the true Christmas gift that happens in the midst of this season that we now call Christmas. The, The Christmas gift is that God chose to give a gift to the world and that gift was his son, Jesus. So our first question, why do we need the light? Why do we need Jesus? I have three answers that I think Jesus gives us in the midst of this story. Here's the first. The first reason why we need the light is we need to know that God loves us. We need to know that God loves us. It seems like such a a trite thing, God loves me. And yet, it's so powerful. It means that we're not a mistake, that we didn't just accidentally evolve from an ape or some other being. It means that, that as John tells us later, that God knows us intimately, that he cares, that he loves us. It means that God is involved in our lives. God loves us. The second reason why we need the light, I believe, is this. We need to know that that God shows his love He shows his love by sending Jesus, his one and only, his unique son, to the world. You see, true love is is different than what we see modeled. True love uh, is is outward giving, outward focusing. True love is is a love that, that sees a need and runs to meet it. Love that's inward focused, that's not God love, that's not pure love, that's, that's selfish love. And it's not the kind of love that God exemplifies. But Jesus wanted Nicodemus to know that, that you are loved. Me coming to the world is an, is an example of how much God loves you. The third reason that I think we need to know, or why we need the light, is that we need to know that everyone who believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. John takes these two words that we have translated believes in, and and he plays off of them over and over and over in this gospel. And it's a unique uh, series of of words, and it's more than just an acknowledgement. Believing in just isn't just an acknowledgement. Believing in is like if I had a chair here. It's like uh, I believe that's a chair, but until I sit in it, you know that I don't really believe in it. And once I sit in it, I put my faith in it. And so this believes in, is, it's, it's bigger than just an, an intellectual ascent. It's to actually put your faith in something. And so Jesus is saying, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. And let me just wrestle a little bit, a few minutes with, or a few seconds with this word, these two words, eternal life. I think... I think when we hear the words eternal life, we, we, we take away the, the beauty and the depth of what that means. I think oftentimes we think, well, that means we'll live forever. We'll never die. And the way that Jesus describes eternal life is so much bigger than that. It's bigger than not dying and not going to hell. It's bigger than life insurance. Eternal life is actually, it's actually life that is unmeasurable. Jesus tells us that later in John 10, 10. Many of you know that, where life, Jesus came to give life to the full. It's, it's this life that's unmeasurable and it's, it's unable to be captured in, in, a, in a human segment. I, I love in John 17 where Jesus is praying, and in the same book where Jesus is praying to the Father, and in the middle of his prayer he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ who you have sent. Jesus in his prayer lays out that eternal life is in knowing God, not just knowing about God, it's in knowing God. It's, it's a relationship. 
That's what Jesus has come to do. That's the light of the world. Many of us in this room have felt the sting of death and and certainly the sting of darkness in our world. I know for me, my grandfather took his own life when I was when I was very young, which resulted in my family never having guns in our house. My little sister died of cancer in her freshman year of college. My friend Darren was killed by a drunk driver walking to my house in ninth grade, which was an event that God used to, to help me to discover who he really was. I've had to perform funerals for teens and adults, and usually I get, only get asked to perform funerals when there's some sort of a... Of a a disaster or something that's happened that's, that's been surprising and hard. And to see the families navigate through this is, is always challenging. The one day they have their friend or their loved one there, and the next day they're gone. And they're left with these questions. Often I look out at young people here, here in our teen services. We have a lot of young people that come through our doors every week because our, friends, our young friends bring them. And, and I look out and I see, I see an emptiness in their eyes. I see death in their dreams and hopes, and the pressure of the life is, of darkness is just pressed in on them. And as we, in our small groups, discuss with them, a lot of them are struggling. I just heard this statistic several weeks ago, and, and it just shocked me. Ten years ago, in our country, the average age of mental health issues was 28 to 30 years old, ten years ago. Do you know what the average age today in our country is of mental health issues? Average age, 14 years old. The darkness of this world is permeating and pressing in, and we all feel it. We all feel it. We've all had to wrestle with this darkness. But God's plan for for us is life, eternal, immeasurable life. This last week, I was invited to go to a prayer service down at the Catholic um, Supply Center just a mile down the road where the horrible murder and the atrocities of evil happened. And, and when I walked in, I was somewhat surpri- surprised by um, how my emotions gripped me as I walked through those doors. And, and just the darkness of thinking what happened in there. And in there I saw relatives of those who have been affected by this atrocity. I saw the heartbreak on their faces. And there are those inside of our church family and those outside of our church family whose lives will forever be marked with this hideous and this evil event. And it begs the question, it really begs the question, if we're honest, God, where are you? What are you doing? Have you abandoned us? Have you left us? Are you involved in our lives? I've seen my own kids wrestle with whether they believe that God was real. And and you, many of you have too. I see our young people wrestle with it. You know, things happen in our lives that make us question, God, are you there? Are you real? Are you alive? In my own life, I've seen a ridiculous bicycling injury uh, affect my physical abilities, and, and that won't change until Jesus returns. But today, I want, to, I want to proclaim to you with greater passion than ever that God loves you and that God shows that love when we look at Jesus. That God's plan for us is life. It's not destruction, it's life. God is for you. God is not against you. Life resides in the person of Jesus Christ. He has come to rescue you from destruction. He has come to rescue you from the darkness of this world. And you may not be able to see with your eyes, your physical eyes, what God is doing in the big picture, but let me assure you, God is for you. God is not against you. Jesus didn't come so that you could just know about God. He came to bring you life, life with God. God is for you and Jesus is with you. So Jesus, the light of the world, came to give us life. That's why we need the light of the world. I'm dead without Jesus, you're dead without Jesus, but I can confirm to you that thanks to Jesus, I am very much alive. Jesus has lit up my world, 
And I can't wait to tell everyone that I come in contact with that truth. And I pray and dream for you also. Don't lose heart, my friends. Jesus, the light of the world, has come to give us light. God is here with us. You are not alone. Do not lose hope. God has not abandoned you. So how, how is your posture toward God? The second question I wanted us to deal with this morning is this. What does it mean to love darkness more than light? What does it mean to love darkness more than light? Well, let's continue in our text and we'll see how Jesus plays this out. Verse 17, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, Jesus says to Nicodemus, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. He continues on. And the judgment is based on this fact. Nicodemus, I can see him looking at Nicodemus and saying this. God's light came into the world, Nicodemus, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All those who do evil hate light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. Now remember, these are Jesus' words that were aimed at a Pharisee or Jewish religious leader who came to Jesus in the secrecy of night. The sun had gone down. He didn't come during the day when people would see him interacting with Jesus. This conversation probably happened uh, under the shadows of a, of a campfire or maybe a torch. And here's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. He says, God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. And in the last bullet point, I can see Jesus saying, Nicodemus, those who, want, those who do what is right, come into the light, come to me, so that, they can, so that others can see that they are doing what God wants. You see, there are two sides to the coin. Jesus came to bring salvation, but... The very fact of salvation for all who believes implies judgment on those who don't believe. The person who doesn't believe in Jesus is, is condemned already. We love C.S. Lewis, and uh, one of the quotes out of, I found out of, out of his book, The Great Divorce, was this. Uh, C.S. Lewis says that in the end, there are only two people. Ones to whom say to God, God, Thy will be done. And ones to whom in the end, God says to people, thy will be done. Why don't all people rush to Jesus? Some say it's because they just don't understand. They just knew. If they just had more knowledge, they'd get it. But, but Jesus says the real reason people don't come to him, the light of the world, is because they love the darkness more than they love the light. Remember what we learned last week from John chapter 1, verse 10, he came into the world, he being Jesus, came into the world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. And just a few verses after the Nicodemus story, we're told this. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. Anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. What does it mean to love the darkness more than the light? It, it simply means that we refuse to allow God to be our God. It means that we choose to not put our faith in Jesus, that we reject his offer of salvation because we love our own darkness more than we love the light that he brings. Our decision to reject believing in Jesus as the light of the world 
brings judgment upon us because he's the gift that God sent to save us. And Jesus knew that we would never earn our way past our own sin, past this darkness and our own effort. And so Jesus laid it out very clearly. He says, Nicodemus, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that ever, whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment, Nicodemus, against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. Family, these are red letter words. These came from Jesus himself, the God who can't lie and won't lie, who loves, who cares about others, who is willing to come and to give up his throne in heaven and come to earth and die for us. He didn't come to judge you. He came to save you. What are we doing with this gift? What is your posture toward God? God has done his part to rescue you. And St. Paul's Cathedral is this masterpiece of art. It's, uh, it's in London, and, and it was um, painted by an artist named Holman Hunt. And the name of this piece of art is called Light of the World. It's a picture of a cottage that's run down. It's uh, bushes and briars are grown up all around it. The walkway is covered by weeds and grass. The hinges are rusty and stained by the elements of nature. And standing at the door, Jesus is holding a lantern in one hand, and with his other hand, he, um, he's knocking on the door. And the lantern is lighting up the whole area. And after Hunt completed the painting and it was hung, one of the critics said to him, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Hunt, you made a mistake. There's no handle on the door. And the artist gently replied, no, my friend, I did not make a mistake. For there is a handle, but the handle is on the inside. The story of Nicodemus ends uh, pretty drastically. We don't really know what happened to Nicodemus, but twice in the, in the Gospel of John, Nic or John mentions Nicodemus. One of the times is in John chapter 7 when there's a, a, a discussion, a heated discussion among the Pharisees over Jesus and why he couldn't be the Messiah. And in the middle of that discussion, Nicodemus stands up for Jesus and he gets berated very strongly. And then there's another uh, sample or example where where Nicodemus is mentioned. We find it in John chapter 19. Jesus had been crucified and he had died. And there are two men who end up uh, being involved in taking him down from the cross and burying him in a, a tomb cave and embalming him in 75 pounds of spices. 75 pounds. Someone had to carry that there. And John tells us that one of those two men was Nicodemus. What happened in the heart and the life of Nicodemus after that, we're, we're not really sure. Only God knows. But what we do know is that what Jesus taught Nicodemus is truth. It's true today. Why do we need the light? The light shows us God loves us. The light saves us from destruction, from death. And the light brings us immeasurable life, life to the full. Jesus came not to judge us, but to save us. What does it mean to love darkness more than the light? It simply means that you choose to reject the offer of life that Jesus has made, that he's holding out to you, because you value the life you have with him more than the life, or without you value the life you have without him more than the life that you would have with him. This morning as we close, I'm, I'm gonna ask us, just for several seconds, just to close our eyes. And what I'd like for you to do is ask the Holy Spirit, ask God to show you what he wants to reveal to you this morning. So just take a, a couple seconds here and let's ask God, what do you want to show us in, in this story, Lord?
If you're here this morning and you're not living in the light of Jesus, if your posture with God has you with your back facing him, then I want you to know that Jesus is shining his light on you. He's offering you life, immeasurable life. He is standing at your door with his lantern, knocking in love to offer you that life. He is the light of the world. And the most meaningful Christmas of your life, if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus, would be this one. If you choose to put your faith in Jesus, if you move from darkness into his light, if you move from destruction to life, Jesus can make that happen this morning. He is risen. He is alive. He is here with us. Jesus is waiting with open arms. He's inviting you to open the door and to invite him in. And if you're here this morning and that's you, we would love to help you begin your relationship with God. After the service, I and a few others will be down, down front to talk with you and to help you to begin your new life. We would love to help you with that. And if you're here and you have needs and the darkness has overwhelmed you, I just want to encourage you to come forward after I close in prayer too. Don't leave this place without connecting with part of your family so that we can go to Jesus and ask him to help us to shine his light on our darkness. Lord, I, I want to thank you for this interaction that we have with Nicodemus. Thank you for the Apostle John who years and years and years after he saw you face to face is still proclaiming that you are Lord and you are the light of the world. God, if there are people here who are living in darkness, I ask God that you would help them today to come into your light. And Lord, if there are those of us here who are darkness has just overcome us through the, through the circumstances of life, God, I ask that you would help us. We come to you, God, and ask you to shine the light in our darkness. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Again, if you're here this morning and you need prayer, please come forward. Don't be ashamed or afraid. Be bold. Go out with the blessing of God and shine his light on this world that we live in. Thank you for being here this morning.